Um, so, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, um, my name is Mike Rietzer. I will talk about redirected walking um, from another perspective, so not on the, the assumption of um, designing redirected walking in an unperceivable way, but with perceivable gains. Um, due to the time limitations, I will all, uh, only talk about the first part of the work and skip the revisiting part. So, Locomotion uh, in VR is challenging. Uh, usually the space uh, that is displayed in the virtual world does not match the one we have in the real world. So the most applied solution to this is the use of teleportation, um, where the user selects a spot where he wants to get, presses a button, and is there. <clears throat> this locomotion technique works without any physical movement, and the user may always stay on the same physical spot. But Teleportation comes with a certain drawbacks. For example, um, users may lose the feeling of distance and may lose their orientation. And it may also have a negative uh, impact on the feeling of presence. A uh, further drawback is that usually one hand is required uh, while the common way we walk through a world, uh, through a world is uh, by using our feet. So another solution to this is redirected walking. <coughs> Um, it aims at realizing navigation within a limited physical space, um, and there are several gains that have been proposed on how to compress a large virtual space to match a smaller physical one. Um, the most simple one would be, for example, translational gains. In this case, um, the user's velocity is scaled, so usually the user walks faster in the virtual world than he walks in the real world. Another kind of gains are the so-called curvature gains, they are realized by curving the virtual path slightly by reorientating the virtual world um, when the user walks. Um, so as long as the user walks a straight line in the real world, he would walk on a circle in the virtual world. And uh, since the user aims at walking a straight line, he compensates uh, this rotation to walk a straight line in the virtual world uh, by walking a curve or a, um, a full circle in the real world. So, over a longer distance, this would be a circular path. Um, so, this is another way of compressing the virtual space into a limited physical space. But redirected walking also comes with huge drawbacks, and one of these is um, the required space. Depending on the source, the diameter of a circle the user walks on has to be 24 or even 44 meters. Um, to be uh, uh, applied without perceiving uh, this manipulation. Um, and this is only for walking uh, a straight line. So if the user decides to turn around, for example, by rotating 90 degrees, you would uh, still need additional space to um, allow navigation. So let's, uh, but let's uh, take uh, one step back, see how curvature gains can be described. Um, when a user walks, um, curvature gains can be described by rotation that is applied um, after a certain distance. So if uh, the user walks one meter, it will be rotated by n degrees, and uh, as a result, he will walk on a circle over a longer time. Of course, the gains are not applied at once, but evenly distributed over the whole distance, so we have a full circle um, that is walked. And um, we can express um, coverage against, therefore, by the unit degrees per meter. So after a meter of walking, you will be rotated by a certain amount of degrees. So now to a little uh, complicated math. Um, we can uh, uh, compute the diameter of the circle by dividing um, the circumference uh, by p and using the unit degree per meter, we can um, calculate the circumference that is needed, so 360 degrees divided by the gain. And now we can um, draw a relation between the applied gains and the required physical space. And this is the curve we can see here. Um, so we see that uh, the radius is not um, linear increasing with the gains. And as a result, we can see that um, shifting the um, detection threshold, as uh, uh, seen here, I don't know if you can see these 
red lines, I think I chose the wrong color. Um, we see that we, we, if we shift the, the huge difference between uh, these two proposed uh, detection thresholds uh, by seven degrees, we only have really pretty uh, uh, less difference uh, in the radius we, uh, we require. And this also leads to um, the fact that if you would like to implement redirected walking in a room scale setup, this is really hard to, to implement and with perceivable gains, uh, unperceivable gains, we won't be able to do this. So why do we only regard the detection and not what happens if we apply higher gains? Um, when we consider again um, the concept of, uh, concept of teleportation, um, the user will always be aware of not actually physical moving. You will be aware of being manipulated by just moving virtually and not in the real world. So why don't we apply these metrics on uh, redirected walking? So when we consider around five degrees per meter as uh, the detection threshold, what happens when higher gains are applied? So we conducted, conducted a user study um, in which we tested gains uh, without considering the detection, um, but applying other metrics. So we tested no manipulation at all, as baseline, and two times, four times, and six times the detection threshold. Um, and asked the participants to state um, how natural the walking experience was, how pleasant it was, if they could imagine to use such a locomotion approach in VR. And uh, since we uh, had very large manipulations in some conditions, we also asked uh, for a feeling of nausea and disorientation. Uh, so this was the task. The user had to walk a straight line from one point to another. Uh, and after the target was reached, he uh, rated uh, the already mentioned scores. So now to the results. And the red lines that are drawn here uh, show not fitted curves, it's just drawn by hand uh, to illustrate the, the trend lines. So first of all, we have the nausea and disorientation scores. We see that uh, 10 degrees per meter, so twice the, uh, the detection threshold, did not really come along with uh, very much uh, nausea and disorientation, while 30 degrees per meter was inapplicable for most participants. Uh, similar results um, were seen in the naturalness of navigation. Also 10 degrees per meter seemed to be very natural, um, 20 degrees per meter seemed to be around borderline, and 30 degrees per meter was unnatural for most participants. Um, the pleasant scores uh, were about the same. Again, 10 degrees good, 20 degrees borderline, and 30 degrees not applicable. And uh, as we see, all of these ratings were quite the same. And if we um, put them together in, in one graphic, we see, okay, we have um, the area of around 10 degrees per meter, which is um, um, still quite the same as no manipulation although the users will perceive this manipulation. We have the 20 degrees per meter, which is um, still applicable for most participants, and uh, the 30 degrees per meter, which we shouldn't apply. We also uh, looked at customization effects. Um, we tested each case uh, gain twice, so uh, we could compare the first iteration and the second one. Interestingly, we saw that um, the first iteration, only 50% um, stated um, the 20 degrees per meter of, uh, as, as being applicable, uh, 38 as neutral. And in the second iteration, it were on 70% who stated uh, to accept such gains. The 30 degrees per meter didn't change, so I think this is already too far and you shouldn't go that far. <coughs> so. To conclude, um, what do we find? When regarding only the detection of manipulation, uh, redirected walking is very much limited to be applied on huge physical spaces. So we found that gains of around two or even three times the detection threshold did not influence the rating strongly. Such gains can therefore easily be applied. The region of around 20 degrees per meter seems to be a borderline. 
against should only be applied with much care <coughs> and the 30 degrees shouldn't be used. So when we compare the radii or the diameter in this case of the circles the user walks on, we see that when using the detection as metric, we require 44 or 24 meters. This is a huge space and <coughs> when we apply twice this gain, we can reduce the space to 11 meters and this without the, the scores we have uh, measured. And uh, when applying the 20 degrees per meter, we uh, can reduce the space to 6 times 6 meter. So this is pretty much it to conclude. I think it is worth having a look at perceivable gains for redirected walking, but it's, uh, it is always a trade-off between the perceived uh, naturalness, realism, and the applicability for smaller spaces. So thank you very much. Was this fast enough? <laughs> Thank you very much to stick to the time schedule. Um, do we have a question? No? no? Then I have a question. Yeah. So um, you say you can increase the game. And do you instruct the people first to stick to the same speed? I, I assume that when you walk faster, the threshold maybe comes down, right? Yes, it is like that. But um, you usually have a comfortable speed that you are walking with. So I think all of the participants walked in around the same velocity, um, but we didn't restrict him to, to walk in a certain velocity. Okay. All right. Okay. Any more questions? We have a bit more time. Yeah. Thank you very much. So this is a question from one, one of the viewers uh, from online. And uh, this viewer is wondering what happens if the user is walking up and down the stairs while in VR he will stay on a flat surface. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think um, if you would apply such high gains, it won't be possible because you are losing slightly the, the orientation and you won't be able to, to walk that comfortable anymore when, when very high, uh, high gains are applied. So this is just for comfortable walking. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again.